Now, friends, the real question here is not so much to what this prophecy points, because I will tell you, it is the beautiful prophecy that points to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his coming, his ministry, what he was ultimately to accomplish, that is an atonement and an anointing of the most holy place. <laughs> Hey friends, Dr. Alan Davis here. Uh, after some of my recent videos where I focused a little bit on prophecy, some of you had questions about whether or not the so-called 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 employs the day-year principle. Well, the short answer is no, it, it doesn't. A as I've stated numerous times over the last year, the day-year concept employed by so many denominations, uh, especially Seventh-day Adventists, has no basis in the sacred texts. It's an assumed conclusion based upon a gross misunderstanding of two texts, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. And really quickly here, what I want to do is explore those two texts in their context to demonstrate both what they are and what they're not saying. So we're going to jump right into it, and we're going to take a look at Numbers chapter 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise." Friends, just as a reminder, this was after the 12 spies were sent into the land of Canaan, 10 of whom returned with an unfavorable report, two with a favorable report, saying that Israel needed to move forward and go into the land and occupy it. Of course, we know which way that went. But quite frankly, friends, this is simple. We are done. The great God, Jehovah, declared a punishment of 40 years for each day of unfaithfulness. D did you catch that? It's a year for a day. It's not a day for a year. Also, nowhere in this passage can one reasonably infer a day for a year concept in each instance of biblical prophecy. Such a course of action, I submit to you, is both dishonest and reckless. Now, let's revisit Ezekiel 4, 6, also within its context. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now, friends, please notice, in this passage, once again, it's not a day for a year. It, with respect to some future context. Rather, Ezekiel is to lie on his left and his right sides accordingly, a day for each year of Israel's disobedience and a day for each year of Judah's disobedience. And here again, a reasonable person cannot take this passage and apply it in a manner inconsistent with the sacred text. Do you, do you see what I'm saying here? Do you understand? Does it make sense? These are years for days. In other words, God prescribed a judgment of a year for every day of transgression with respect to the spying out of the land. And here again, Israel was disobedient for 390, day, uh, 390 years, and Ezekiel was commanded to lie on his left side 390 days. And the same thing with Judah. It was disobedient for 40 days, and therefore Ezekiel was commanded to lie on his right side for 40 days for a total of 430 days. Now, I realize many of you uh, who are watching have bought into this understanding over the years. In fact, I did the same. You know, you, you listen to people up front, and oftentimes, because they speak with authority, we don't necessarily challenge these particular conclusions. We might go into the Bible, and we might see, yeah, that's what it says in Numbers 14, 34, but we don't critically think what's actually being said in the passage itself. So I would encourage you to do those kinds of things. Again, don't listen to me. Please, go into the text. See it for yourselves. Now, we have to realize 
that it's very difficult to unlearn that which we have learned because it's been pounded in into us time and time again because it was made to fit the narrative, especially within Seventh-day Adventism, that we were told to believe, namely the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14, as well as other prophecies in the future with respect to Daniel and Revelation. Now, I say this with a heavy heart, but I do mean it. Dishonest or perhaps ignorant men have fed you these lies for decades, and in some cases centuries in other factions of Christianity. Why? To stir up the emotions and to incite the opening of the purse strings. Follow the money. You have heard me say this time and time again. All the hypersensationalism over the years, and yet, friends, we are still here. Whether it's a clever manipulation of typology and symbols, or perhaps another letter about what the Pope is or isn't doing, or maybe it's two letters, one after tax season and the other one right before the holidays, or perhaps what the politicians specifically in Washington, D.C. are doing to fulfill Bible prophecy. And as a result, many of us over the years have swallowed it hook, line, sinker, fisherman, and boat. That's just the way that it's been. We have to come to grips with that and now step away and say, is this really so? And through all of that, for what? Where has Jesus been in all of these things? How has it affected your personal life, especially your mental and emotional health with respect to anxiety and fear? Friends, I leave that to you individually upon which to reflect. But you cannot tell me that it has not impacted you, perhaps even burdened you in some way, shape, or form. Despite the false narrative, friends, you can take comfort in the prophecy of Daniel 9. I have been asked that time and again, and I have told you that I will do a study on this, and that is where we are now. Now, I will tell you right up front, we're not going to cover it at all in this video. There's just way too much to discuss, but we're going to at least get into it and demonstrate why the day-year principle is not applicable to Daniel chapter 9. So, moving on. Um, because of the language that's used in this particular chapter, uh, the reader, that is you, even if you cannot read Hebrew, can know that Daniel means 490 years when he speaks of 70 weeks. Now, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to open up some other translations, I'll put them on the screen, to demonstrate a consistency within different variations of the scripture, uh, specifically the English language. That's all I'm going to look at right now. But those of you for whom English is a second or perhaps a third language, I would encourage you to look at it in your native tongue, whatever that might be, and I'm sure it's out there. Now, I did say that you can know that the prophet means 490 years definitively, and I'm going to go over that in a moment, but before I do, let's take a look at some of these passages. We'll begin with the King James. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Let's take a look at the New Living Translation. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Next, we look at the NIV. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Moving on to the Revised Standard Version. Seventy weeks of years are decreed concerning your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Finally, in the Amplified Version, we read, Seventy weeks of years, or 490 years, have been decreed for your people and for your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make atonement, that is reconciliation, for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, that is right standing with God, to seal up vision and prophecy and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, friends, I, I want to make it very clear. I don't necessarily agree with all of these translations in total, but my aim here was to show you a consistency in phraseology. And now, before I forget, 
you will notice the word reconciliation being employed in the King James. And yet we read in the other translations, and some of them are paraphrases, but many are translations, the word atonement is being employed. Friends, that was the purpose of this prophecy, such that it would culminate in a single act of atonement, such that by such that through Christ, God was reconciling the world unto himself. What does that mean? He was in Christ making an atonement such that if we come to him and we believe, we will indeed have everlasting life. And this is life eternal, friend, that they might know God, Yehovah, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. That is the purpose of this prophecy, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because we really need to examine how do we know it's 490 years. In the King James Version, the term 70 weeks is being used. Other English translations, as we saw, use the same or similar verbiage. However, please note again the New Living Translation, 70 sets of seven, the NIV, 70 sevens, the RSV, 70 weeks of years, and the Amplified, 70 weeks of years or 490 years. And the point I want to make here is this, friends. All of these translations from the Hebrew are correct. They are not interpretations. In the Hebrew idiom, such a prophetic expression was not about some obscure day-year principle, but rather a restoration for Israel after they'd served out their punishment for disobeying God. You see, friends, God has now meted out a punishment based on earlier prophetic proclamations through Moses in the Torah, specifically in Leviticus, that there would be punishment if they failed to do a particular thing. Now let's take a look at that beginning in Leviticus 25. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard, and the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beast that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And then, friends, in Leviticus 26, we read, You shall keep my Sabbaths, and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments, and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate. And ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths, while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because, even because they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. Now friends, do you see what's going on here? God in Moses made it unequivocally clear that for every year that the land would not be permitted to enjoy its Sabbath rest, God would require it of them. He would even use a forcing function, if you will, to make sure that the land got the rest that it needed. Why? Because this was a test of their obedience, their faithfulness. They came into the land. God led them out of bondage through a mighty right arm. And he had them enter into his covenant rest that is a complete and total reliance upon him. And he wanted to continue to show them how he would bless them. And this idea of the Sabbath was not only a weekly memorial, but it was also every seventh year such that now the land would rest. And if the land were not allowed to rest, God would ensure that it would. So now let's read in 2 Chronicles 36. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Did you see that, friends? 
The land <clears throat> was to keep its Sabbath for 70 years. You see where this is going? Every seventh year, the land was to keep a Sabbath. However, for 70 sevens, Israel failed to follow God's command in this respect. For 490 years, I'm thinking you're beginning to see it, they failed to follow the prescription. And therefore, at the culmination of that 490 years, God brought an enemy, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, to take them into captivity so that the land might realize its rest. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 25, we read the following. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Again, friends, let me ask you, why did Jeremiah prophesy a 70 year captivity? Because he was aware of the prophecy and the edict giving, given in Leviticus, the Sabbath rest ordinance for the land. Every seventh year, the land was to lie fallow and rest. God warned Israel that if they did not keep that ordinance, he would remove them from the land and enforce, enforce the Sabbath rest law of the land. Jeremiah knew it would take 70 years of rest to accomplish God's judgment, and Daniel was aware of this promise as well. Now, if it were a day for a year principle, then it would not be, in this instance, a year for a year. Do you, do you understand what's going on here? Because if you want to reckon a day for a year, then you would need to somehow come up with the typical 360-day year and then project that upon the actual time prophecy. Well, that would never work now, would it? Do the math. So when God says, in this particular case, it's a prophecy for every year that you don't allow the land to lie fallow, I'll require it of you. No day year principle, friends. But what we do see is 490 years of disobedience. And we're going to see a juxtaposition here momentarily. The Hebrew idiom of 77s in Daniel 9 relates to the idea that after 490 years of disobedience, resulting in 70 years of captivity, Yehovah would bless the people after a period of 490 years of being restored to the land. And that is what 77s entails. Now, really quickly, before we go too much farther, I want to queue up what we're going to talk about here in the, the ensuing videos. But let's take a look at the complete prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, shall we? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, friends, I'm going to break here just for a moment because earlier in these other translations we read, it didn't say the most holy because oftentimes it's been thought that this refers to Christ. And yet these other translations say the most holy place. Is this significant? It is. I'm going to cover this in a future video. Going on. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, friends, the real question here is not so much to what this prophecy points, because I will tell you, it is the beautiful prophecy that points to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his coming, his ministry, what he was ultimately to accomplish, that is an atonement and an anointing of the most holy place. But the enigma here is when did this prophecy go into effect? And there are a lot of different viewpoints on this, friends. We're going to examine it in the next video. But before I close now, I want to share with you there are six major things that we can derive from this prophecy. Number one, the time period involved, 
490 years, a stark juxtaposition that is born out of disobedience and an ensuing captivity, and then ultimately to the greatest gift that God could ever bestow upon mankind. Number two, the purpose of the period's culmination. Number three, the beginning of the time period, that is when we begin counting. Number four, what will happen to the one mentioned in the prophecy? Number five, what transpires after the one prophesied is cut off? And number six, what the one's ministry will accomplish? Again, the critical piece of evidence, in my opinion, is number three, which is when to begin the historical reckoning. And for that, I'm going to ask you to please tune in next time when we will examine how, proof positive, this prophecy is the most compelling one in all of Scripture. Sadly, it's been shunned by Orthodox Jews and grossly misunderstood by many evangelical Christians. And until next time, friends, this is Dr. Alan Davis wishing above all things that you might prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Amen.